many masks, hopefully vaccinated faces. And I'm seeing the knots, I love it. <laughs> All right, welcome, welcome, welcome to Bustle and Pose Books. Presents Eat at the Work Village when your wife has Tommy Jones surgery. And I'm sure a lot of you are wondering what that even is, what's going on, what's the story, what's the happening. And Ethelbert is actually here to tell you all himself. And without further ado, I'm actually going to pass it along to Kate Damon, who's going to do the introduction today. And just a reminder to all of our live stream viewers at home, you can actually purchase a signed copy of Ethelbert Miller's recent book, uh, When Your Wife Has Tommy Jones Surgery, until 10 p.m. tonight on the Ethelbert office. And let's get started. Okay. Okay. Ready? Okay. Ready? 
records made to be built up. Tonight we gather to celebrate Ethelbert's deep love for baseball and the poems that come out of that love. He continues to show us that he is a man who knows a thing or two about how to blend the science, grace, and beauty of baseball, of life, into the magic of poetry. So I'd like to welcome Ethelbert, who's going to give us a reading from a little bit of his first book, a lot of the book that you're here for today, and you might even give us a little sneak peek of his third book. Green. A Green 
you know, we cannot be isolated. We see that in terms of issues, in terms of climate change. Then there are the COVID. There aren't any barriers in, in border that you can say, that's Germany's problem that that affects us. We're all connected, and this is where the solutions are. And so this is just one point, but it talks about the whole series and all the things that we're going to face with. Now, Tommy John, you know, I'll read a poem that is sort of a companion poem to when your wife has come to my surgery. Because I felt that what happened, I probably needed a poem somewhere in the book that would explain Tommy John's surgery uh, to someone who's not familiar with me. A few months ago, here in the area, um, I think it's George Mason, a young uh, pitcher, died from complications of Tommy John's surgery. Um, and that's the first time I heard of someone dying from Tommy John's surgery. You could have taken a tendon from your leg and put it into your arm. Because then you know that the arm really is not designed to form a baseball consistently. Uh, especially when you see uh, young kids growing up, you know, little leaves, things like that stuff. They'll tell the people, don't have a young kid trying to throw a purple. But that repetitive motion of throwing, uh, that's where you hear a lot of pictures blowing out their arm. Okay? And Tommy John was like the person who had done that, but then they were able to restore his arm. And he was still an all-star picture. In fact, some people say, you come back and maybe you're even a better picture because your arm is stronger. Um, but the, the surgery uh, is named as Tommy John because he's the first player to do that. And so I try to have a poem that documents that. Tommy John knocks on the bedroom door. One. Once my arm around her was like circling the bases, she was the woman I came home to. Now my arm I'm tossing to sleep, the pain throbbing here and there. My wife sleeps in another room. Two, they call him a bionic man. His arm repaired to someone that came to Mr. Thompson all over here on the corner. Three, he might never pitch again. His elbow gone, blown. What is the one of the collaborative reconstruction? Where did they take the tendons from? Tommy John. Was an all star in 1968. So many died that day. MLK, RFK. Tommy John was on the mound one day in 1974. That day, the butcher came and cut it down. Grown men are known to cry when they're on the field. Their arms limp. A manager's hand on their shoulders. Dreams die when they reach that first step of the dugout. I read you. This poem comes out not from the very door. I heard you four sessions. The fifth section is just a list of all the baseball players who have had Tommy John surgery. I'm going to show you how effective it is to judge one's career. Show me a time had Tommy John surgery, and you can see how he's changing this work in terms of history and the game itself. So that is a Tommy John not from the very door. And now here's the title poem of the collection. When your wife has Tommy John's surgery. Your wife says she needs therapy. Her words keep in the corner of the plate. You step out of the box and talk to yourself. You already know the next pitch that's coming. It's the argument that leaves your hands with marriage deception. It's the hard fast stuff, the slamming of the door, the turning the back and then. You can no longer recognize the rotation of love. The spin of desire, the funny movement of lust. Your wife has changed, and now she's seen some of uh, One of the things I like about this poem is what you see happening today in terms of the analysis and the ability to, to measure things. And so you can no longer recognize rotation of love, the spin of desire. You can think about that and try to bring that into your personal life, you know, the spin of love, because it has a right rotation. And I see the right thing. And I give a lot of gifts and do a rotation in it. It just floats. We saw a lot of things happening during the pandemic. And this is one that I try to give a humor into um, poetry, but it's also a very political poem in terms of what it said. It's very short. The cardboard season of 2020. The summer 
of that last man. He looked around the empty ballpark, staring at black cardboard faces, wondering who decided where to place us. He located them as we said, okay, who decides to put people in? And it's also funny when you put like this in the back of the um, it's always back in the family park, cardboard back in the family park, more back in the book cardboard that actually has never been a game if it's the And then, you know, you want to say, for example, you know, we watch games, um, you look at the games on television and it's behind, you know, the, the, the play. There's a good scene right there, you know, and, well, if you can watch a lot of games on television, there's not a lot of black people sitting <laughs> so now we got the cardboard faces that you see here. You know, and the cardboard people are really happy because they wait years to get to the seats. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, just to show you the connection of the people who are One of the things I had done at the picture was this, um, and some of you have been doing for many years, um, I created this so that people have to use. Um, many people know me for my Omaha poems, which is in the West of the Young West of China. And I wrote those things of poems because I felt like the issues that we were facing were those issues of religion. And so I wanted to have a poem that, especially by the way to schools, uh, I could talk about Islam, uh, I could talk about, you know, how I'm and the differences and, and not being the other. Because many times in, in middle school and elementary school, kids didn't be teased. You know, about their names and their faith, and, and, and I wanted to make sure I explored that. In writing about baseball, I wrote this poem that's in this collection, uh, and it's called Roberto. I don't know whether I need to have some more poems of fresh out, the friendship, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that after I read this poem. Roberto. Some kids in the projects didn't have gloves, they caught them a fair handed. Or so they wanted us to believe. Roberto's mother got him Converse sneakers, but they had him sign the logo. He cried until the death of the long time. It was all his mother could afford. We didn't know that because we were children and had no kids of our own. We had gloves, cheap gloves, gloves with no pockets, no matter how much we kept punching in the center of them. The gloves had missing pockets, had our missing fathers who punched our gloves and swung back to that pocket. Our fathers were born, and we outgrew their absence. Our hands became too large for small gloves. Many of them were all stolen. One winter, we threw and caught snowballs with stiff fingers. Roberto was got me good, and his kept laughing, saying he was tormented. That was a year after we discovered he was Puerto Rican, and Spanish had yet to know in his mouth. This is a poem that feels like you're where my poems come from. This is a poem that comes out of my childhood. Um, if you read the God of the Baseball, you know that in the beginning of that book, there were a lot of poems about growing up as a child in the South Bronx and this book. And the people in that, and those poems are real friends of mine, you know, Carlton, Patrick, and Rail. And in the housing project that I wrote in the South Bronx, the St. Mary College project, we were not African American. Outside the process of change community, uh, which is mostly Puerto Rican, and I had a friend of mine, Alberto, who would come into the house by the day for us. And I remember, and I remember that, this is what's in the poem. He got his Congress speaker, you know, that's when the Congress was a speaker, like, 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 he got his Congress speaker, so excited, right? And he got his Congress speaker, so excited, right? And I remember the poem said, I'm being with him, and then I thought, well, it was a cheap Congress speaker, and then, you know, we're young, we're not laughing and stuff like that. And I still can see the hurt in my brother. You know, I mean, he was just really so sad. Uh, and Jerry so, said, you know, now I can look at him and I say, well, wow. that must have been a lot for his mother to buy You know, he might have said, I need to see the music. His mother might have the ones that took for his comments, but they were not the real comments. And, uh, you know, you look at this in terms of um, what. I write about, I write about baseball, I write about the I write about what happens, you know, I write about issues of race, I write about how it's 
time, young people can start, and writing about domestic violence. All these things come into these poems about baseball. And that's why I say, okay, maybe this isn't a very fast time. You know, uh, that is a great piece of domestic violence, this, this, this issue that's in many households. And so I try to address that. I try to address bullying and all these types of things that are very really important. Um, this is one poem here. The legal news. Um, as you can see, I have a section page on the cover of the first book. The third book, uh, How I Found Love Behind the Kids, we have to come out next year, will have Josh Gibson. So it's like a little gathering, which you can check with Tom Jumbo in the middle. Well, I, I sort of write more about the legal baseball movement. And uh, this is called the legal baseball movement. A few people here, as you go ahead, Mark, uh, people who were at Howard University. I worked 40 years at Howard. You could have done more. Everything in my office was second hand. I stayed surrounded myself with the blues and heavy hitters. Still in Brown, Albert Murray, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, D. Roy Jones, and Josh Gibson. One afternoon after lunch, I sold my soul in the sundown. I was cool, Papa Bell, until the sun came out. They said I hit like Robert Johnson, but ran like D.D. King. When I was a student, Mark Ray tried to take me home, which is why I never left. Don't let a blues woman touch the back of your head. Don't let her hear your howling words. Control your love by staff your favorites. If you have to resuscitate, you have to hesitate. <laughs> and now, I'm going to end with a few poems from uh, when you write as when the when the power from the this is nice. Um, this is called it's out of the baseball free jazz. And what you see me doing uh, in some of the poems is not just dealing with African American literature, African American music, but African American visual art. It's out of the baseball of free jazz. Today I ran into John Chair. He had a pocket trumpet in one pocket and a baseball in the other. He reminded me that I should be practicing him. When I write, I tend to bounce words off the wall instead of throwing them at the top. Cherry wants to play Kelly Coltrane in that Atlantic Guard Park around 1966, the same year you all were the Dodgers in the World Series, and you all thought it was too much Charlie Hayden on base. There's a lot of uh, work done in there, um, but it's actually built around the dumb Cherry, John Coltrane, and Atlantic Guard Park. That came out in 1966. And so I link that here, you know, to the all Australian Times in the World Series. You can see how like, the poetry is constructed around, you know, visual arts, music, uh, and baseball. This is uh, Ken Griffith Sr. in the post of Ken Griffith Sr. Even before my son turned his cap backwards, I wanted to keep him close, keep an eye on him. I didn't want to work beyond the outfit of other fathers. I love watching my son play, the way he watched me play, the way we played together. Before the love of the game, it was family. And how we loved each other was how we hit the other men upon him. There were times when his injuries made me close my eyes. But my eyes could never close after seeing the beauty of the swing or the catch he made with the wall. Baseball was good to us. This year will remember us because we made this year. My son all the famous smile, another RBI, the record doors. And I think it's so, so special about, you know, Ken being with you. I mean, to be a part of Sun Foundation, to be on the same team, people all run through the same game. I mean, that's something that, you know, you could be right into the natural, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll give a this poem. Um, some of us can stand here in front of the Sam Gilliam. Because if you have to come apart and ride an underpass, we have a Tacoma station, it's San Gilbert Mill um, from a mile to a rainbow, so you walk out to see that beautiful San Gilbert. San Gilbert, some of us are standing in front of San Gilbert. When did I stop walking up, sending poems to journals, doing workshops, readings and conferences? When did I no longer write? 
the page. Largely, I no longer have a desire to buy a ticket to watch the game. I passed the metro station. They would take me to the ballpark. I'm in the same train car as Clay in New York's play possession. Lula is sitting next to me. She's a type of woman who only takes jail positions and ballplayers for money and get seats. <laughs> I tell young writers to read box stores and not headlines. Romance is like the weather, difficult to predict and always changing. <laughs> Let me live in a small room with a television for a few more years to live. Please take my clothes to the cleaners. Clean my seat before I die. Baseball has no arms. You can only hold it for so long.
<laughs> you know, um, and so what happens is that just that experience changes you, you know, um, because I like to look at the nation on the TV, but then I also like to, you know, look at what's happening in the world park. Uh, and so, so all of a sudden, um, I fulfill my mind and from the point of the bank. And there's always something going on, and that's what, that's what about 50 or 60 can be at the 6 or 7 years, you know. Father, that you see how 
this is some kind of big part of it. The throne of the baby of the baby of the kitchen of the sun. And I was going to my father, and then that's what he said. I was going to go in. And then my mom had to say, she's so low. But you do have that. Um, I'm amazed at how uh, 
How did you have the softness and the love in it to use your poetry? Okay, um, this is a, um, the sports world can often be so aggressive. How did you access the softness and love into your own poetry? You know, I'll, I'll look at something that might be overlooked. It's a book, okay? And I have a word from this word. And when we talk about softness and being like this, I, I want to have someone like, who's a baseball fan, right? Because sometimes I see this sort of beauty that I can see it from the time. There's a certain aspect that there's a certain beauty in the game. Um, there are sometimes moments of tenderness, you know, especially after a loss, you know, especially after a loss of a World Series, you know, you see players and so on and so because you realize that this might be a good thing that you never get to win the world. There's a softness, I think, in terms of the physical beauty of the ballpark, that when you enter the ballpark, the, the grass, you know, the air, there are things that you look for. This is back to meditation. You know, you go to the ballpark, and so much you can take in. If you find that softness, so it's not all hard balls and bats and bats. There's another beauty of the game that's there. The fact that you didn't want people to play the game. Because sometimes the game is an extension of that love that is in a particular family. You know, uh, that love of that you're a small child and you're living in public. You want to get to the show because you want to take care of your family. And there's a certain tendency to come. And there's also a tendency after injuries in which someone says, okay, I have to hold your arm and I have to take your arm back and shit. So what we don't see many times are family, many times wives who are taking care of their husbands you know, who are playing baseball, who have a CD, or dealing with the fact that they now want to sort of retire what they want to do and get this fellowship intimacy. Okay? In fact, some players recently have a difficulty walking away from him because they miss what they see in the dark. You know, they, they miss that 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 and you can still train. And so a lot of things there that will show us that you can use more things that you can do. I think as a former athlete, I feel that so deeply, and I think that's one of the reasons why we connected early on. Um, I'm one of our first fans because of that, and I feel um, like a lot of you probably understand that while just looking in the game. Um, okay, so here's another question. Are these the same people or different? Different people. So, with the, the prospect of a third book, do you consider your work sort of a trilogy or a three standalone text? Is there a defining theme for each of the books that you've published so far? Well, uh, in, a, in an email, uh, they would say, if we live, if we live long, <laughs> he said, maybe we can put them all in one, we can combine all of them together. And they said, that's that would be nice, you know, to have them all together. Uh, and so, so um, that's really good too, because I'm certain some people want to just have one of these books in their collection. You know, you know, but, uh, and and they're not like the terrible one, you know. Um, of course, I, I would say right now, the, the one that's coming out is going to be one of the big ones, but buy this one. So that, that's my best one. Okay, I love this question. Um, Did you write this issue for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> These are coming from over there. That's really coming from over there, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, there's a beautiful feeling of nostalgia in your poetry. Is that intentional or something that happened naturally as you were writing? I think that's not intentional. The other fact that you know, I love my childhood, you know, so you know, so things like that. But that's all that is intentional. I'm gonna interject on that one because. I experience your poetry in a really different way than I think most people do. Um, I often wake up to a point, um, or if I check my mail, I have mail, um, but I don't normally read it this way. And I think as I got to know you, 
well, first of all, again, I got Jen first as a human, not as a poet. And so it's been really beautiful to watch your process and understand your processes that I've seen you over the last 20 years. Um, but also, I think, going back to something you said earlier, um, the, the, all of the work that you wrote last time in Canada, um, I really, it's just everybody knows what is this, this body of work. It's um, going to be the little book of me, um, and there are haikus that I don't think we're in every day, but almost every day, right? After the pandemic started. And for me, you were also sharing them, or you would remind me that I should be looking on Facebook or something. And I really struggled with them. And I realized, I think, in that moment that they were just crushing my soul in a strange way that I just couldn't take in because I was already struggling with being in the low pandemic. But I recently reread them. And it's like so different format. I think it first grew from um, just a Microsoft Word document that you probably ran. And then I started reading them to record them. And it totally changed the entire body of work for me. Um, and I find that now it gives me joy rather than feeling the pain. So that, I would say, is I would encourage you sometimes if you find a point or something that maybe touches you one way, maybe go back to it later another time. Because I just see the oh, you know, I mean, you know, I'm not over it, but, you know, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. So how do you process my work? Uh, and then the you know, we were just thinking about the paper and said you got a video on the screen. So so what happens is then that and we made you know, we also I'm looking at the work completely different. You know, uh, and that's what I think is back to the poetry. No one's going to read it from the poem the same way or the same reading from uh, and that's why it's so beautiful and still in a way of cutting from borders.
um, or your local store. Um, and you're done, right? Thank you guys so much for coming. I'm going to do something.